people are entering the Zoom room. Just give them a few seconds to come in. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Morgan, and I'm an event manager with Politics and Pros, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. Soon, I will drop a link in the chat where you can order a copy of A Harp in the Stars, an anthology of lyric essays straight from PNP's website. You can ask our speakers a question today by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can towards the end of the program, but we apologize in advance if we don't have time to get to your question. Also, there are auto captions for this event by hitting the live caption button also at the bottom of your screen. Let's introduce tonight's guest. Brandon Billings Noble is an essayist. Her collection, Be With Me Always, and anthology, A Harp in the Stars, were published by Univer the University of Nebraska Press. She is the founder, founding editor of the online literary magazine, After the Art, and teaches in West Virginia West Lane's Low Residency MFA program and Goucher's MFA program in nonfiction. Uh, she is also the editor of the anthology we're discussing today, if I didn't mention that already. Tyrese L. Coleman is the author of How to Sit, a 2019 Penn Open Book Award finalist published with Mason Jar Press in 2018. She is also the writer of the forthcoming book, Spectacle with One World, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Writer, wife, mother, attorney, and writing instructor, she is a contributing editor at Split Lip Magazine and occasionally teaches at American University. Her essays and stories have appeared in several publications and noted in Best American Essays in the Pushcart Anthology. She is an alumni of the writing program at John, Johns Hopkins University. And Leah Purpura is the author of Nine Collections, a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. She is a Guggenheim NEA and Fulbright Fellow and has been awarded five Pushcart Prizes, among others. Her work appears in The New Yorker, The New Republic, Orion, The Paris Review, The Georgia Review, Agni, Emergence, and elsewhere. She is the writer in residence at UMBC and has taught at conferences, workshops, prisons, and in communities and MFA programs throughout the country. It Shouldn't Have Been Beautiful and All the Fierce Teachers are her latest collections. Let's give our guests a virtual round of applause. Thank you all so much for coming and uh, thank you Politics and Prose for hosting and thank you Morgan for those introductions. Um, I'm Randon Billings Noble, I'm the editor of A Harp in the Stars and I'm gonna start things off by reading a little bit from the introduction to the book. To the ear, lyre, the instrument, and lyre, the noun, sound the same, which I resist because I do not condone lying in essays, lyric or otherwise. But mythology tells us that the origins of the lyre come from a kind of lie. Hermes, the god's messenger and something of a trickster, stole Apollo's sacred cattle. Taking off the cattle's feet, he reattached them backwards to hide their tracks as he drove them to a secret cave. When Apollo could not find them, he was furious. Hermes tried to deny his theft, but ultimately confessed. In atonement, he gave Apollo a new way to make music, the lyre. First made of a tortoise shell, reeds, and gut, it evolved into a U-shaped instrument, similar to a harp with a crossbar and seven strings. It was played alone or as an accompaniment to songs or poems, music to sweeten a story. Apollo accepted the gift or payment really and became the god of music. Later, he taught Orpheus how to play the lyre. Orpheus became the best musician and poet known to humankind. He charmed trees, rocks, and rivers. While sailing with the Argonauts, he overpowered the sirens with his songs, allowing the ship and its crew to pass safely on their quest to find the Golden Fleece. And when his wife died, he sang his way into the dark underworld to retrieve her. His music was so powerful, it could almost, almost raise the dead. Lyric essays have the same power to soothe, to harrow, to persuade, to move, to raise, to rouse, to overcome. Like Orpheus and his songs, lyric essays try something daring. They rely more on intuition than exposition. 
They often use image more than narration. They question more than answer. But despite all this looseness, the lyric essay still has the responsibilities of any essay to try to figure something out, to play with ideas, to show a shift in thinking, however subtle. The whole of a lyric essay adds up to more than the sum of its parts. Lyric essays require a kind of passion, a commitment to weirdness in the face of convention, a willingness to risk confusion, comfort with outsider status. When I'm writing a lyric essay, I'm not worried about what it is or what to call it. But when I started teaching lyric essays, I needed to put words to the form, to try to define it, to make it at least a little more accessible and understandable, even as I kept running into contradictions in my own thinking. Sometimes I enjoyed the lyric essay's elusiveness. Other times I felt like I was the one following the backward hoof prints. But the lyric essay's wildly capaciousness is among its strengths. I came to define a lyric essay as a piece of writing with a visible standout or unusual structure that explores, forecasts, or gestures to an idea in an unexpected way. But about that visible standout unusual structure, those gestured to ideas, lyric essays are tricky. If you try to mount one to a spreading board, it's likely to dodge the pin and fly away. If you try to press one between two slides, it might find a way to ooze down your sleeve. And if you try to set it within a taxonomy, it will pose the same problems as the platypus, a mammal, but one that lays eggs, semi-aquatic living in both water and on land, and venomous, a trait that belongs mostly to reptiles and insects. It will run away if on land, its gait that of a furry alligator, or swim off in the undulating way of beavers. Either way, it can threaten you with a poison spur before it ripples off. In this anthology, you will find a wide range of thinking about the lyric essay, how it can leap, search, wander, hint at, unravel, excavate, and create, how it can both replicate and explain trauma, how it comes from or leaves behind fiction and poetry, how it acts like a panther, an iceberg, an on-ramp, an artichoke, how it's defined and how it can never be defined, how it tries and how it delivers, how it sings and how it plays. Orpheus's lyre accompanied him through all sorts of adventures. It traveled with him as deep as the underworld and after his death was sent by Zeus to live among the stars. You can see its constellation, Lyra, in the summer months if you live in the Northern hemisphere, the winter months if you live in the Southern. This feels like an apt metaphor for the lyric essay. The stars are there, but their shape is what your mind brings to them. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Therese Coleman. Uh, thank you for uh, joining our event today for A Harp in the Stars. Um, I feel very honored to have been included in this beautiful anthology. And I think that um, if you are a teacher or a writer of the lyric essay, this is uh, a textbook for you and you definitely need to order like a ton of copies. <laughs> um, I'm gonna read my piece that's in uh, the book. Um, it's also in my book, How to Sit. Um, it's called Why I Let Him Touch My Hair. I sat beside a white boy in a dead bar. Alone, he slurped beer, watched football. Hair yellow like an unpeeled onion, no sign of sun on his skin. A typical white boy. No match for me, yet <laughs> I started it. Impressed him with what I knew white boys liked. Metallica, tits, Seinfeld. He was nice. Bored, I guess. We talked for a little while, both in our 20s, both Southerners. I desired his attention because he didn't give it freely. He spoke anxiously. An awkward laugh followed every statement, every eyeball dash at my cleavage, each concerned glance upward at the wild black kinks springing from my head, and then each nervous scan behind him around the room his fear empowered me. 
In fifth grade, I fought a white boy beside a stack of gym mats. He touched me down there. I looked like a China doll, my aunt had said, fingering my jet black hair. Sizzled straight, it framed slender shoulders, stuck against my skin by hair grease and sweat. She favored me, they all favored me. Lighter than my cousins, my honey complexion drew their wrath. White girl, you think you cute? Headaches from pulled hair, arm scratches from fighting. I fought him, at least I tried. We never played together. Yet he chased me around the gym, cornered his prey. We were children, just children. And maybe to him, that was what children did. But there was an authority to his touch, an exerted right, his God-given right to me because I was pretty. He said I was pretty for a black girl. Another laugh, another glance around. My new friend took in my hair again. So I asked him what he thought about it. He said it was cool. I scooted closer to him. My cleavage slow dancing in his eyes, up, down, out, in, with every breath. I offered, do you want to touch it? We had an audience, another black woman beside me. I ignored her. Her disapproving stare should have told me something, the way she shook her head to herself. I offered, do you want to touch it? A white man used to visit my grandmother. He was married with kids my age. He drove a red truck flying down our dirt road like it was his. I get home from school or playing and see his truck in the yard. The rule, don't go in the house when that truck is in the yard. Middle of the day, face red with sweat. I remember him flushed and always smiling. Brown mullet glued against his neck. He'd walk right on in the house, no knocking or nothing, as if it were his. I grew up in front of him. By 13, he looked at me funny, but most grown men did. Now he'd come and I'd leave or I'd stay and he'd give my grandma money right in front of me. Winches, what we were called during slavery. And without me seeing it, I knew he did that every time. Every time he gave my grandma money like she was his. In college, I let the white boys I worked with see my tits. We were friends, the bar was slow. I wasn't the only girl flashing my breasts that day. It was all right. My title, the black girl. The only one surrounded by white boys. The conversation, the color of my nipples. Were they coffee colored with large areolas? Were they saggy National Geographic tits? I laughed, we were friends. It was all right because of that time that drunk guy called me a nigger and they threw him out. Cool, because they liked rap and were from Baltimore or Philly. Their boy was black. White boys who talked about the Asian hostess's sushi. White boys who said they never date a black girl, even if she was pretty for one or their friend first. White boys who wanted to party with my black girlfriends after work, three, four in the morning, and when I said, no, they're sleeping, white boys who demanded I wake their nigger asses up. White boys who refused to apologize, but we were friends though. Now at a different bar, a different white boy extended a shaky hand toward me. I lowered my head. Who knows what I expected being petted would feel like. His touch was surprisingly soft. He rubbed my hair only bending the ends. Done, he cried, I did it! His accomplished smile. My power disappeared, if it had ever existed to begin with. Thank you. Wow. It's um, a good thing I had my my sound off because I was here just mm -hmm myself to myself. It was gorgeous. Um, so I'm going to read uh, from a few sections from the essay in this amazing collection. 
and the essay is called Loss Collection. It's made up of a few different titled sections. And um, so the essay as a whole is looking at different lost chances for relationships, uh, for reciprocity with uh, the other than human world, um, sort of lost tethers to cycles and to elements um, that we collectively used to be intimate with. Sparrow, who cleared the bird from the stony path? The bird I was watching become something else. It's wet feathers matting, then drying and parting back to skin. In a few more months, the ribs would have been a house framed out, barrel staves. Then once the spine showed the keel of a skiff, already wind was passing through the very body it used to lift. Such strange reversals the end brings. The bird was one of my private measures of time bent to its work, pairing, reducing, and recomposing. Those colonies below digging in and fattening on the body. I was tracking increments how the bird wore its days, or days wore a bird. I kept it as evidence of one of the ways the world goes on without me. That the world goes on without me is an old and familiar shiver. Lying in bed on a summer night and hearing the older kids still at their games would join with a flash of kids in Japan at just that moment on the far side of the globe rising and eating their morning soup. I was not moved to slip out and play with them or pinch an arm and confirm myself. I only wanted to be and not be simultaneously for as long as the displacement lasted. With the bird gone now, what's missing is a way to reset the day. I keep checking the path for the cycle ongoing a being turned toward becoming again. Recently in that spot, one rock balanced just so on another became a dark breast feathered with dampness. A bent tab from a coffee cup was a beak. There was some solace in imagining, but without the body, time's renegade. It can't be illustrated by a diminishing wing. Its increments are not en route to anything. And this next section is called Fire. Of one form of lost intimacy, Thoreau wrote, I sometimes left a good fire when I went to take a walk on a winter afternoon. And when I returned three or four hours afterward, it would still be alive and glowing. My house was not empty though I was gone. It was I and fire that lived there. Then things changed at Walden Pond. Quote, the next winter I used a small cooking stove, but it did not keep fire as well as the open fireplace. Cooking was then for the most part, no longer a poetic, but merely a chemic process. It will soon be forgotten in these days of stoves that we used to roast potatoes in the ashes after the Indian fashion. The stove not only took up room, but it concealed the fire, and I felt as if I had lost a companion. Such are small reveries improved away. And what of other losses sustained? At the moment, plumbing moved inside. I imagine I would have felt very keenly the absence of wells, the thrice daily and thrice itself gone chore of fetching, the load awkward and heavy, but on the way there and back, a quiet all to myself, the scrape of the empty bucket descending, the plunge and fill sounds, the crank tense and rope spooling, my face in ripples surfacing, the over full splashing on legs in summer, so sweet. What's the word for an elegy that mourns a thing it never knew? my tallow candle 
its buttery crackle. My jeweled preserves on a pantry shelf in winter light. Trees. Once that sound, wind through trees, was a forest breathing. A body moving through woods understood it. Breathing meant many things. Signs of rain or evening coming, early notice of seasons turning, a density of pines giving way to meadow. But now, even if you stand very still, in deep winter, high summer, it hardly matters. What you're hearing is likely distant traffic, planes above clouds or generators. Not a deep sigh, not a thought humming. To think that a forest might breathe now is a fancy, a state modified by that empirical phenomena of will, as Coleridge said. Whereas it used to take imagination, that higher form, the living power and prime agent of all human perception, he wrote. So went the romantic notion that by overcoming intellection and knowing the world to be animate, we might regain for brief spots of time all that's been worn so thoroughly away. The force that renders land, water, and trees quaint, meaning charming in an old fashioned way, settles in. Settling controls and legislates. To suspect that a thought might be called quaint cinches in imagining. It damns the changeable truths of a stream, shrivels a phrase like the wings of trees. Quaint won't let a body see green in flight or suggest the song of budding pears is in any way pinkly audible. And this last section is called Dodo. Once men with their dogs, cats, rats, and pigs overtook the quiet island of Mauritius, the Dodo disappeared. In one 1622 account, a whole flock of dodos hearing the squawking of a single bird rushed to the scene and all were captured, snatched easily by hungry Dutch sailors. With no natural predators safe and content on their wooded island, dodos nested on the ground and spent their days eating and sleeping. Though capable of running, there was no need. And their beaks, though hooked and powerful, found no occasion for self-defense. Imagine a flightless three foot tall bird, heavy and round with a tufty tail and afterthought wings, coming easily up to you, tipping its curious bald head to one side, fixing you in its bright yellow eye. Imagine it eating from your hand or working beside you, plucking crabs at low tide, or that by watching and tagging along, you'd be led to all the fruit you'd need. Speculation about the dodo's name confirms a very different stance, perhaps derived from the Portuguese dodo, dudo, or doido, meaning fool or crazy, or from the Dutch dodor, sluggard, or dodars, fat ass. As late as 1766, Linnaeus coined ditus ineptus, the inept dodo, and still today, dodo means addled or laughable or dumb. And what might be the Linnaean for one who blames a thing for its own demise? Once there lived an animal whose proportions were perfect, precisely suited for a quiet life, for roaming grassy spots near shore, gathering abundant fruits, seeds, roots, and nuts, who moved through its simple day in no hurry at all, no fear at all, in a place acknowledged as paradise. To find a name for such a creature by which we might recognize others like it, to specialize innocence, classify unguardedness. We lost that chance long ago. Thank you for listening. What a pleasure to hear these essays read out loud, essays that I've um, read on the page, on the screen, that I've read with students. Um, I can't tell you how exciting it is 
um, to sort of, uh, I guess, see this anthology come to life in a way um, by hearing these essays um, read by both of you. Thank you so much. Um, we are uh, open for questions now. If you want to type yours into uh, the Q and A box at the at the bottom of the screen. Um, all questions welcome. Please don't be shy. Um, well, while we're waiting for some audience questions, um, Brandon, did you have a piece in the book that you like to read? Uh, I do. Um, I have a hermit crab essay in the book called um, The Heart is a Torn Muscle. And um, I'd be happy to read it. Um, it's, uh, it's fairly short. Um, I'd be happy to read it while we take some questions if I can find it in my own book. Sure. Ah, here it is. Uh, the Heart is a Torn Muscle. And this is a hermit crab essay, which is an essay that borrows another form of writing, an extra literary form of writing to take as its own structure. Um, so this essay is written in the form of a medical advice site, like a WebMD entry. The Heart is a Torn Muscle. Overview. Your heart was already full, but then you saw him. And your heartbeat code, not Morse, but a more insistent pulse. Oh yes, that's him, that one. Not the one, capital T, capital O, the one you already have and deeply love. But of all the people in that large room far from home, he was the one for you. And your heart stretched more than it should have, tore a little and let him in. Symptoms, swelling, bruising, or redness. The feeling that your lungs contain a higher percentage of oxygen and have somehow grown in their capacity to respire. A heightened sensitivity to glances, postures, gestures, attitudes, and casual remarks from observers. A propensity to blush. Pain at rest, general restlessness, an inability to sleep, fever dreams, sleepwalking, conscious walking, out of your bedroom, out of doors, into the moonlight or an unknown field shrouded in mist and ache or fantasies of same. Pain when the specific muscle is used. When your heart beats to force blood through your femoral arteries, to your iliopsoas muscles, your sartorius muscles, your peroneus muscles, each expanding and contracting to force your legs to walk away from him, from thrill, from all the promise and potential of an alternate future. Inability to use the muscle at all, lethargy, apathy, malaise, especially after having walked away from the one in question. Self-care, apply ice, cool it. The early application of heat can increase swelling and pain. Note, ice or heat should not be applied to bare skin. Always use a protective layer, latex only as a very last resort. Clothing is better or better still, distance. Several feet, a separate piece of furniture, a wall or a building. Ideally, a state line, a continent. Try an anti-inflammatory such as herbal tea or a pro-con list. Cool showers and brisk walks, embracing air may help. Do not take depressants in the form of alcohol or otherwise. Avoid stimulants, caffeine, chocolate, Cheetos. Protect the strained muscle from further injury by refusing to jump into anything. Avoid the activities that cause the strain and other activities that are painful. Compression, hold yourself together. Elevation, rise above. When to seek care. If home remedies bring no relief in 24 hours, call your youngest and most bohemian friend. If you hear a popping sound signifying a break from your primary relationship, the one, capital T, capital O, you truly know and truly love, call your closest and most trusted friend. Exams and tests. Your youngest and most bohemian friend asks, are you gonna run away together, tryst in motels, meet up in Paris, open a PO box, wear a trench coat, give each other code names, assume another identity? Would he be up for a threesome? Want to use my place? Says, it's so romantic. Says, tell me everything. 
Your closest and most trusted friend asks, what do you mean met someone? Have you thought this through? Is this choice supporting, adding to, enriching, complicating, marring, degrading, not even leaving a blip on the screen in the way in which you will see your life in the years to come? What will you be left with? Regret, memory, or absolutely nothing? Says, time wounds all heals. Says, don't fuck up. Recommended reading. Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, The Bridges of Madison County by Robert James Waller, Time Will Darken It by William Maxwell, The Lone Pilgrim by Laurie Colwyn, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, The Literal Zone by Andrea Barrett, The End of the Affair by Graham Greene. No horoscopes, no tarot cards or tea leaves. If you must, you may steep yourself in stories of passion and price. Years from now, you can indulge in what ifs. But for now, right now, put your hand to your chest and feel what beats. The only muscle you can't live without needs to stay whole. Thank you. All right, so we have um, some questions in the Q&A box. Thanks to everyone who, um, Throw one in there and feel free while we're actually discussing the questions to add one as we uh, continue with this event. I'm just gonna go ahead and start from the top um, from an anonymous attendee. Um, why did each panelist choose the form of a lyric essay to discuss the topic in the piece they read today? That's a really good question. Um, I'll, I'll start out. Um, I chose a, a hermit crab form um, to write about this transgressive crush I had. Um, because with a hermit crab form, the structure is really rigid and laid out. And I think those are helpful when you're trying to encase content that might be mo emotionally messy or intellectually messy, messy. If you don't really know what to do with um, a particular subject, choosing another rigid form to write in can help because a lot of the choices are made for you. Um, so you can't, um, you can't get too wild. Um, you can't um, veer too far from whatever your, uh, your subject matter is. Um, so in some ways it works to protect vulnerable content the way a hermit crab's shell can protect the vulnerable body of a hermit crab itself. But in an also, it can act almost as, um, as a casing for the content to sort of burst out. Um, like a shotgun shell or the, the outer layer of a seed. Um, so then the content can emerge from that and um, do what it's going to do in the reader's mind. Leah, did you want to answer or you um, I can go? Yeah, go right ahead and then I'll, I'll follow it up. Okay, yeah, so I, um... <laughs> I don't know if I intentionally uh, meant to write a lyric essay. It um, was it was intentionally supposed to be a flash piece because um, I wanted to. I didn't want to. I was more interested in how to relay these this particular moment and flashes about a moment in time. Um, and a mo you know a moment of being a moment in time that is significant and um has you know multitudes of layers to it so uh it was a particular um event that happened that had always stuck with me and in thinking about like okay why did i let him touch my hair what was that about like that was just and i i started to interrogate my relationship with white men basically and different moments throughout my life where um that relationship seemed to be complicated or um you know uh sort of leading up to this this period where i just kind of thought that i was in charge but really was kind of relinquishing it so that's sort of what the piece ended up as. Um, 
I I'm hesitant to like start off with too many expectations when I write in terms of like what I'm trying to do. Um, I did put a word count on this because I was intentionally trying to write flash, but if I had started writing it and it turned out to be longer, it was just going to be longer. Um, but yeah. And then later on, I realized, Oh, I, I guess I wrote a lyric essay. <laughs> so that's sort of how that worked out for me. That's great. Um, my, my first, um, response to that question was, and I, you know, I try to really listen to what sort of comes up intuitively in response to, to, to people's questions. And so the, really the first thing that came up for me was helpless to do otherwise. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't um, think about writing a lyric essay. Um, I, th this is how I think and write. Um, it takes many different forms. Um, I'm pleased that they're seen as, you know, lyric, you know, that's a nice description and um, happy to be associated with that adjective. But I think Teresa's um, like seed, when she said, what was that about? That's like the start of everything. Like, what was that? What was that about? Um, what was that about? Any way you want to inflect it, that that to me seems like you know the the drive behind be, behind adventurous writing. Um, why did I notice these things? How do they go together? Um, how does one idea in one small piece seed another piece? Um, so, I also want to just give a nod to Randon's thinking also about f form and formality. Um, you know, she described really well that it's kind of the distinction between writing formal poems and, you know, free verse poems. And if you're writing formal poems, meaning the form's been received, um, uh, sonnets, right? Villanelles, pantoons, guzzles, anything like that. Um, you understand the parameters, right? And you're absolutely free to, to create within those parameters. And that's an incredible release. Um, so, you know, if you choose a form, like with certain uh, contingencies and requirements, you know what, you kind of know what you're moving within, you can just kick loose in that, in that, you know, within that form. Um, free verse poems are not free. You discover the form as you move through it, as you move through them. Um, and that's generally the mode that I, I work, I work in, right, kind of by way of discovering what a form might want to be and listening for it and trying to write into it and so so there <laughs> um i think you all answer kind of answered another question that's here already uh from laura laura Lanig. uh can each of the guests talk a bit about how their essays began um, what was the thought that sparked the essay so i know you all touched on that if there's anything you'd like to add um, I will because it speaks to kind of the um, the painful intersection of writing and life. Um, when I was thinking about the subject matter, I knew I wanted to write it in a particular in a form, um, not as a traditional essay, um, whatever that is. Um, and I was thinking about this crush, and I was thinking, in my experience at least, a crush can't be indefinitely sustained. It has to break at some point. Either you're um, you're over it or you consummate and then you begin a relationship and the crush sort of changes. So I thought about writing about it in the form of a timeline. I thought about writing it um, in sort of like the story form of like rising action, climax, falling action. Um, but I was away on a writing residency and I was moving a really heavy desk so that I could position it to look out the window and I pulled a muscle in my back. And so I went to WebMD, not as a writer, but as a human being in pain to look at how do I fix this torn muscle? And as I was looking at the different headings, like um, symptoms and self-care and exams and tests and uh, further reading, which on WebMD is always horrible because the end is like, you have a fatal illness, like read this and prepare yourself. <laughs> um, so I tried to make mine a little cheekier and maybe a tiny bit more upbeat, but I recognized that um, 
that was really kind of advice for how to deal with a, a torn heart muscle, a muscle that stretched and moved in a way that it kind of shouldn't have. And so I think part of writing these more lyric essays or any essay really is to just always have that little essay eye out um, for possibilities that happen um, just in your regular non-writing life. Um, so it was that unfortunate event of having that pulled muscle that made me um, think about writing the essay in this particular form. And this is one of the very few kind of miraculous pieces of writing that feels like it just happened. Um, and, um, and I'm so grateful for that one because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't always work that way at all. Um, but that's a little bit more about where kind of the idea started and then um, how I chose this form to express it. Anybody else want to jump in on this question? All right, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, Laura Hogan's question. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. All lovely selections. Thank you. I'm, cur I'm curious to each of you. Uh, I'm curious how each of you uses rhyme in musicality and language and how you achieve that. I noticed some returns to images and some repetition of phrases that indeed bring a lyric quality throughout the pieces. Are there conscious ways you work towards this as you are writing? Do your ideas usually come first in images or do they begin with a certain sound or language? Thank you. Oh, that's a really good question. I, uh, I usually don't consider intention until I get to my editing phase. So what I usually end up doing is writing a draft and putting down sort of like how I feel, what my thoughts are, how I kind of want it to be. And then, especially when it comes to short pieces, um, most of the magic, if there's magic, <laughs> um happens when i'm editing and i go through sort of a process of editing that is um that I, I call it editing with intention because um once i have something written i and i have an idea of of what it is that i'm really trying to say then that next phase of writing a piece is to then add things that I think will be um, helpful in getting across what I want the piece to be about without being blatant and saying, this piece is about X. So like, so I will, um, I will go through and edit with an intention to try and get my, my thoughts across. And then I will, or revise rather, and then I will, go through the process of trying to decide how this sounds, how these words work together, et cetera. And a lot of that comes from reading the work out loud to myself. Um, I like the things that I write to sound like I am speaking. I don't want to ever feel like I'm writing something that is false, especially when it's um, a lyric essay or a piece of creative nonfiction. So I'm looking with an eye of does this sound natural coming out of my mouth? And so I read it out loud. And occasionally, that comes across as sounding lyrical, when I think it's part of dialect, when I think it's part of like, you know, um, how I hear people talking around me, the people that I grew up with, how I'm interpreting sort of that part of, you know, that language in and of itself. I used to write poetry like a long time ago. Um, it was real bad. But part of the things that I uh, enjoyed about writing poetry was being able to play with language. Um, and so I try to incorporate those things um, into, you know, whatever it is I'm writing. And then lastly, um, and this isn't necessarily how I develop it, but um, I, when I was at 
uh, Hopkins, um, one of the um, instructors that I had, had us read this book um, from a uh, Ghanaian writer. And it took me forever to read the book at first. And then I realized that what he was doing was essentially writing the book in a form of dialect that sounded if I if I used you know the the periods and the commas and the m dashes and etc in the way that they were meant to be used sounded a lot like um, African American vernacular English and uh, in my mind what that did was just it, it completely blew my mind it changed the the way that I wrote um, and made me realize oh I can just write in the way that I talk. <laughs> and not worry about whether or not it's grammatically correct, whether or not anyone else understands it, but other people who talk like me. So sometimes those that lyricism comes in through just trying to make something sound good to your ears versus having like a actual, like, you know, step by step, this is what I do. Wow, that's so great like that closing the gap between how you sound to yourself and how you sound on the page. Uh -huh. So in thinking about this question, again, the first thing that came to me was jump rope and growing up playing jump rope. And I don't, this is a whole campaign I have about getting kids to play jump rope because I don't see enough kids playing. Um, but I, I grew up with this and there's songs that go along with it. Right. And everybody's sort of chanting these songs and, and you're jumping, you know, either, you know, one one rope or, or double to those songs. And it's so natural in so many ways as a kid to have music or chant like expressed in your body. Right. Mm -hmm. And unless you keep dancing, um, <laughs> it, it leaves, you know, like leaves your body. Um, so I you know, I, I, I try to, you know, stay as close as I can to like physical sensations when I'm writing. Um, so I'm listening. Um, I listen to people talk all the time. I listen for patterns. I listen for like speech patterns because they're beautiful to me. They're interesting. Um, and I write them down. You know, I write down what I hear. Um, and so I read aloud every, I read poems aloud to myself before, not my poems necessarily, but before I start writing, I read poems aloud to myself and I get the sound of somebody else's voice in my head. And then I read my work aloud to myself all the time, which can be really painful. Um, but there's some, there's always, you know, some pattern in there that wants to kind of form up and take shape. Um, so uh, there's, there's not that much, um, you know, intentional at first going on. Um, there's a lot of listening and a lot of mess and a lot of chaos. And one of the things I like to show my students is like first drafts of, Elizabeth, of many poets um, work, but Elizabeth Bishop's first drafts are great because they're, they're you know, especially of, you know, something, her, <clears throat> her um, Villanelle uh, one art, the first drafts are terrible. What we would think of as terrible, but they're not, a, I mean, you can't say they're terrible. They're just early, they're young. They're trying to find their way. Um, and they're, you know, they're trying to find a form and they're trying to find a pattern and there are all kinds of questions written in the margin. So, you know, you, you have to kind of upend from thinking about like first drafts as, you know, awful. They're just young, they're not awful. Um, so I, I think kind of building a pattern where you're listening, not just seeing because sight is such an intense primary um, sense, you know, but to build a practice where you're listening um, and, and, and writing things down as you hear them um, makes it uh, m more likely that you will sound like yourself on the page you know, or keep that sense of yourself on the page. 
Gregory Pardlow has a gorgeous poem called Double Dutch, by the way. Um, so that probably rambled way off the subject. But. No worries. It felt very lyric essay-ish to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I love what both of you said. I love the phrase, um, <clears throat> was it editing with intention or intentional editing? Um, because for me, a lot of it, and this is such an unsatisfying answer, it just happens. Um, but I know that's an unsatisfying answer. So I try to think a little bit harder, like how did it start to happen? And one way um, is to draft messy, as, as you said, and then go back and edit with intention to be looking for patterns, because I feel like a lot of this is almost excavation more than building, like there's something there that you're discovering and you're sort of digging into it and you're sort of dusting off little, little bits and pieces, and then you can start to hear rhythms or see a pattern of repeated images and then in the next draft work with those. Um, so when it doesn't just happen, um, that's what I try to do to uh, kind of capitalize on the natural rhythms that have come from a piece and make them more intentional, um, make them um, reveal more about the, the subject or the content. Thank you. All right, going to go ahead and try and answer these um, last few questions. Uh, the next one's from Fiona Hanley. Thank you for such great readings. I would love to hear from the writers about when the shape of the essay enters the writing process. Is there from the is is it there from the beginning? Is it accidental? Is it something discovered? Is it something editorial? Um, I think we've touched on this already a little bit, but if anybody would like to elaborate, I think all of those suggestions are fantastic. Editorial, you know, intuitive, discovered. Um, sometimes surprising. Um, I think if, if you can think about like the, the most vast number of ways that art can happen, that's really the most helpful thing. But those are those are really fantastic um, uh, suggestions. Um, so I guess my response would be, yeah, they, you know, Essays for me happen in all of those ways and parts of essays also happen in all of those ways. So there are a whole bunch of different ways of, you know, creating even within one essay. You know, you might be reading it as a reader and see a whole, right? And see there was a conception. And this is how, you know, I'd like to know how the novelist did that or, you know, how the, how the essayist did that. Um, and and I think probably the truest answer is there, there were probably like a number of different compositional methods along the way. And most of the time they didn't feel like methods um, to the writer. So, uh, you know, we tend to see these holes, but things come together in, in very odd, sometimes surprising, disparate gift-like parts. I think uh, keeping a sense of play um, is incredibly helpful and to be willing to take um, extreme risks, especially like in the privacy of your own brain or at the privacy of your, your own desk. And I find that this can kind of go in both directions. I was asked to write an essay about Sherlock Holmes, the Sherlock Holmes novel, A Study in Scarlet. And I love reading. Um, I went through a huge Sherlock Holmes phase um, you know, when I wanted to be a spy, when I was playing a lot of violin. So I thought, great, yes, I'll totally do it. This will be wonderful. And I thought I was going to write kind of a traditional-ish appreciative essay about this book. But what happened was this really weird segmented essay that was divided into 69 tiny little sections, because that's how many inches I am tall, which had a logic that I won't get into. Um, but what I thought was going to be traditional skewed really weird, just because I kept playing with the idea, like, what is the study in Scarlet. Where does this come from in the book? And I started playing with some quotes. So what started as something traditional turned out into something lyric, but it can go the other way too. Um, I had a piece published in the Modern Love column of the New York Times that reads as a fairly straightforward essay, but it didn't start out that way. It was about being ambushed from, um, by the love of my young life who got back into touch with me um, right after I would married somebody else. And I had to write back and tell him like the sort of fantasy that we had that we would have a life together is, is over. 
and I was reading passages from the US Army Rangers handbook on ambushes because it felt like this email ambushed me. And then I felt like I kind of ambushed him right back by saying like, sorry, I'm already married. And so I researched ambushes and counter ambushes and I had all these quotes and I thought what I was doing was so clever. And then I looked at it and I just thought, what do you do? Like, no, no, no. And so I took out all those quotes and the essay just kind of smooshed together. And when I read it through, it read almost exactly the way it wound up appearing later. So sometimes you can start playing with something and it just doesn't work, but that leads you into um, an eventual form, a final version of an essay um, that's, ultimately, um, that's ultimately satisfying. Yeah, I don't have much else to, I feel like the responses from Leah and Randon were really, um, really great. The only thing I would add is uh, a lot of times for me, what ends up happening is I'll have um, like the thought of something that I want to sort of like think about or um, or I'll like do like a, a timed writing thing where I'll, you know, it'll be first thing in the morning. And like, okay, what I want to write something, you know, and this is what comes out. And then later on, I'll um, interrogate why that came up in my mind. Um, but a lot of times, um, I, you know, my brain works in like, in scenes in like little small scenes here and there. So sometimes I'll write something and it's a scene from, you know, my past and then I'll write something else that's about something else and then for whatever reason they end up going together not intentionally um so sometimes it's it's about playing with your work and trying to figure out like whether or not something you know looking at what you've done and trying to decide okay maybe this little thing over here that didn't really quite make sense but now i've written something else and that goes with it it feels like let me you you never know what it's going to look like until you put it on your ms word doc mm -hmm. and see it in front of your face and read it and you're like oh yeah that totally that's it you know all right uh this will be our last question um lyric essays seem to be having its time in the spotlight mm -hmm. do you agree what do you think about that what does that mean about our world today and literature in general? Wow, that's a big one. I think we're tired of standard definitions in general on a larger scale and fixed genres and art that kind of asserts itself as hybrid and as existing along a spectrum of being. I think is really authentic and speaks to, um, you know, ways that that folks are perceiving these days. So, um, you know, the ways that we thought about, you know, essays as having, you know, a body and a, you know, the sort of one or a couple paragraphs of introduction and then a body and then a conclusion, right? Certain rigidities of form, I think are just being detonated left and right, you know, for the health of everyone's psyche. So maybe we're part of that. Yeah, I think, um, I agree. I think, I think everyone is sort of interested in new techniques and new ways of thinking and of reading and um but i will also say that like what i enjoy about the lyric essay um is that it, it so i think of a lot of what we think of in terms of traditional writing is very westernized it's very colonized it's very english and european and um we don't necessarily live those types of lifestyles. We don't, you know, a lot of us are not, um, you know, living a traditionally linear sort of, you know, every single scene leads up to another scene, leads up to another scene, leads up to another scene. 
what our lives are more like. And when we think about in terms of creating meaning around certain individual moments are these snippets of time where we gather knowledge through, through these important moments of being. And um, being able to then create some sort of understanding of, of meaning through looking at these, these small moments rather than, you know, this sort of linear sort of traditional, you know, European narrative is, um, is a lot more um, representative of what our real lives are like. And I, um, I, I bring this up a lot in discussions, but um, I, I once read this essay about um, uh, the house on Mango Street which, if you've never read, is a um, a novel in vignettes um, written by Sandra Cisneros. And one of the things that um, this author talked about was that um, the sort of vignette form or like the, the flash form or, or the type of this type of form is um, much more indicative of the experience of, of women of color because we often live our lives in sort of these moments of invisibility and then these moments of hyper visibility. And in each moment has its own sort of understanding and meaning, but they aren't necessarily, um, you know, they're a little bit more uh, uh, expressive of sort of the, the day to day understanding the art form of of living within a society and being someone on the margins. So I I personally feel like the lyric essay and other types of forms, hybrid forms, are allowing us to express our own stories in a way that feels more consistent with who we are as people. Um, and also, you know, I don't know about you, but I like to think and use my mind in different ways um and you know lyric essays allow us to chip away at meaning uh, at each each time we are reading it like it's not this it, to me they don't necessarily feel like the same thing every time i pick up an essay so um so yeah i i think that they are you know their moment is uh is here but they've all always kind of been around for a good chunk of time so they're they aren't brand new um uh, but, um, you know, it's good that we are finding them again and, and learning to, to appreciate them again. I agree. Um, and I love what both of you, both of you said. Um, I do think in a way the lyric essay is, is in the spotlight, um, in, but in a, hopefully in a, in a more natural way. I think that once you name something, um, then you can see it more easily. Lyric essays were, I think, always happening, but once the term sort of stuck to some extent, um, then um, our awareness of them increased and then we started to see the possibilities of what they could actually do. Um, for me, lyric essays are much more closely aligned with the way that I think, um, you know, making an intuitive leap or putting two things together that wouldn't necessarily easily talk to one another, but somehow to my own individual mind, they make perfect sense. They want to be in conversation. And so I think that the challenge um, that lyric essays pose, you need to be really engaged with them. You need to do a little bit of the work um, in reading them because sometimes there will be an intuitive leap and you have to say, wait, how did those two things go together? Oh, and as Tyree said, it's it's almost the never the same essay twice um, when you reread a, a, a lyric essay. I think new things happen. Um, and I, I both enjoy and appreciate that challenge. Um, that lyric essays are really digging around. They're really curious. They want to know, they want to ruminate. They don't necessarily have to have all the answers, but they want to think and they want to think creatively. And I think that's always a valuable and necessary thing. But I would say in 2021, um, now more than ever. Thank you all for asking those questions um, via attendees. And thank you for our authors for answering them. Um, we're a little over time, but before we go quickly, can each of you um, mention a book that you're reading at the moment? Um, Brandon, you can go ahead and go first. 
Sure. Um, I'm, I always read multiple things at once. I have a hard time choosing, but I'll be quick. I'm finishing up a big reading project of reading every essay in Philip Lopate's anthology, The Art of the Personal Essay, because I had never read all of those. I've read some, but not all of those. So I feel like it's, um, uh, it's, it's a lot and there's a lot that's missing. Um, but it's been good to go back to some of the, what he calls the forerunners and the sort of early essayists to remind um, where some of these traditions came from. Um, but I, I can't read all essays all the time. And so uh, I recently um, finished uh, the novel, The Vanishing Half um, by Britt Bennett that um, really knocked my socks off. And I am slowly reading through Mira Jacobs graphic novel, Good Talk, because I don't want it to end. I love the idea of organizing a graphic novel um, with um, different conversations, um, mostly with, uh, with her son. And um, I'm savoring it, I'm letting it linger. But those are three things that I've been reading around recently. Great, um, Ty Reese, would you like to go next? Sure. I um my reading reading like in an actual book is has been uh limited to reading and doing research for the book that I'm working on. So that book is uh Midwives to Medicine um on how the on the creation of gynecology as a as a medical study which is a very fascinating book, um, but I don't know if that's exactly what you all are looking for. I tend, I am obsessed with audiobooks because I put them on, I can clean the house, I can do my nails, I can do all kinds of stuff. And I am currently listening to uh, Kennedy Ryan's book Real, which is a romance novel about um, like an actress and a director. And then I also just listened to um, The Sandman, Neil Gaiman's The Sandman um, Act Two, which just came out on, um, on Audible. And it's amazing. Um, listen, if you can, I recommend listening to Act One and Act Two because they're full cast and the production value is amazing. Um, so yeah, I, that's, that's what I'm currently uh, uh, partaking in right now. <laughs> Uh, and last but not least, Leah, what are you reading? Um, well, for big respect for folks who can listen to audiobooks, I get I either run myself off the road or just get so involved I slow everything down and it's like I wash one dish in an hour. I just uh, I can't do it. Um, but I wish I could. Uh, I just grabbed the stack of books behind me because this question always makes me go completely blank. So I am reading Natalie Diaz's Postcolonial Love Poem. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading A God in the House, Poets Talk About Faith. And I'm reading Seek You, uh, which is a gorgeous uh, graphic novel by Kristen Radke um, on loneliness. Mm -hmm. Loneliness in America. And it's it's absolutely beautiful. So those are those, those are three things within reach that I can touch and tell you I'm, I'm honestly reading them. Well, on uh, the behalf of Politics and Prose, I'd like to thank all of our essayists today for doing this event with us. Um, uh, we will also like to thank our attendees who tune in and watch our events. We also encourage you to purchase a Harp in the Stars straight from our store. Uh, we're open. For, to the public and the link is in the chat if you'd like to purchase it online. Uh, your purchases make these events possible and enjoy the rest of your Saturday afternoon. Bye everyone. Thanks. <laughs>